So, hi everyone and welcome to the this week's Earth Science Research Group seminar. Um, yeah, so today we're, we're excited to have our first speaker from a different continent. <laughs> uh, I'd just like to highlight the, the, the schedule for the rest of the seminars coming up this semester, which I'll post in the chat on both Zoom and YouTube. And um, Pete Burgess is going to be chairing this seminar today. So I'll hand over to Pete now. He'll introduce our speaker and he'll take questions at the end. Oh, and also if you are watching on YouTube, uh, feel free to type in the questions into the chat and if there's time at the end we'll try and ask them on your behalf so over to you pete cool thank you caitlin so um very pleased to welcome sultan um he's um i'm a big fan of his research work so this will be really interesting um just to give you a bit of background he's he's um a, a geologist obviously he trained um in romania originally we got bsc and an, an msc and then moved to um California to do his uh, PhD from from Stanford and then he's had a, a, a mixed academic and industrial career so he spent some time uh, as a lecturer in, in uh, the university where he studied actually in Romania originally and then uh, before he did his PhD he spent some time in industry in both Shell and Chevron and then he moved to um, the Bureau of Economic Geology in 2017 and he's been there uh, ever since as a research scientist and his research interests um, are quite mixed siliciclastic sedimentology with a focus on gravity flows I guess that's what you did for your PhD right Zoltan it was it was yes that is correct. okay and then um, he's done quite a lot of 3D seismic interpretation as you would expect from an industry person and I, I remember I think Zoltan and I first met when he was a um, in a, a different research group to me in, in Shell working on seismic related things. And then um, he's also a stratigraphic forward modeler um, and has produced some absolutely beautiful models of fluvial meander belts, the things I think are probably uh, get lots of attention on Twitter and so on. And he's also um, interested in reproducible scientific computing, which I guess follows from several of those other things. And uh, in terms of personal information, he, he takes fantastic photographs of birds, which if you watch his um, Twitter feed, you'll see. And also he runs, we were just discussing this, he runs a lot and uh, faster and further than I do. So uh, we, we won't say any more about that. So Zoltan, thank you for, for joining us to present and uh, over to you. Thanks a lot, Pete, and thanks for inviting me. Um, and uh, I, I also would like to thank uh, uh, Jake Kovalt, uh, a colleague and a friend, uh, who is actually giving another talk right now. Um, it's not too late to switch. Uh, and uh, Margaret Murakami, who helped to solve a, a, a software problem I had been struggling with for a while. And then uh, uh, Matt Walensky, who has, uh, uh, he's the one actually who introduced me to the idea of dynamic time warping, which I will talk about later. So calling this chronostratigraphic diagrams revisited is a bit, um, it, it probably raises the expectations too much. What I'm really, um, I'm really trying to do here is uh, revisiting uh, some excellent papers, some of them very old, like this one uh, from more than 100 years ago, Joseph Farrell's classic paper uh, on the segmental record uh, and also the, uh, the classic uh, chronostratigraphic diagram paper or, or the Wheeler diagram from 1964. Uh, and I also want to revisit uh, some of the fantastic data from uh, the Jurassic Bank experiments. And uh, there are numerous fantastic papers that I could have selected uh, to put here, but this is one of my favorites. And uh, finally, last but not at least, I want to talk about this uh, short paper by Laura Lee Wheeler and Dave Hale, uh, which talks about using uh, a kind of a chronostratigraphic diagram for uh, correlating well logs. But let's start uh, way back in time with Beryl's, uh, what I like to call Beryl's time elevation curve. Uh, and what uh, you see uh, in, in this curve, in case you, in this plot, in case you are not a stratigrapher or sedimentologist, then uh, uh, let me quickly go through it. 
uh, it, it has time on the on the x-axis and and thickness or elevation on the on the y-axis uh, and this curve is the time elevation curve it describes how the the, the surface of the earth is, is moving up and down at a point uh, and then you can see here the stratigraphic section uh, on the left that is left behind by such a curve and this curve of course is artificial it just uh, combine the number of sine waves uh, to uh, to create this. And uh, then he points out that the only time intervals recorded by sedimentation are the black lines of these black bars over here. And what is white uh, along the time axis that is not preserved in the stratigraphic record. And that's, you know, if somebody asks you estimate the, the amount of time reserved in the stratigraphy or the stratigraphic completeness for this, I think that would be an interesting psychological experiment. Nobody has done it, but I think most people, even uh, stratigraphers, would would overestimate it. Um, now, this is I, I found I knew about this. Uh, Brian Romans has been has written a beautiful blog post about this. Uh, it's uh, uh, I, I knew about this, but I. I don't think I really fully understood it until I, until I tried to animate it. And this is what you see here. Um, so obviously uh, blue is deposition, red is erosion. And what you see along the time axis, which is the horizontal axis, is the color code uh, it also includes, in addition to preserved deposition, which is blue and erosion, which is red, it also includes these gray bars, which are, I called it here vacuity, but uh, because that's what uh, Harry Wheeler called it uh, in 1964, but it's essentially deposition that has been eroded later. So these are durations of time during which there was a, a deposition, but later uh, that deposit was eliminated. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is an artificial uh, um, um, curve. But we can we can make these graphs if we have the data if the if we have the data we can make these graphs uh, for any uh, kind of uh, data set and setting and uh, you see how the the blue bar here it, it basically tracks the fraction of of time uh, that is preserved in the deposit and you can see how it it basically fluctuates around 0.3 and end up ends up being something like 0.20 uh, point Point two, essentially. So that's only about 20% uh, of the deposits uh, uh, are actually preserved. These blue bars here are exactly pretty much the same as, as Beryl's original plot. I, I, it's, it's pretty amazing that he did that plot without computers and it's, it's really precise. So just to recap uh, some of these ideas, and maybe this is known by everybody, but it took me a while to, to arrived to this uh, super simple slide. So if we consider stratigraphy in time and space, then we have obviously deposition and erosion. Uh, and deposition can be either preserved or eroded. Uh, and then we can, for all of these, uh, uh, we can consider all of these quantities, we can consider them in time or as, as a duration or in space as a thickness. Uh, so we have six, six uh, quantities that are all different. Well, uh, not all different. I will get back to that uh, in a second, but I also want to, uh, to, to point out that uh, duration as a fraction of the total time is basically stratigraphic completeness. And the duration of, of um, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm getting mixed up, uh, but the, the, the time of deposition that was later eliminate, eliminated by erosion, that is vacuity or, uh, you know, the, the right, I, I described it already, it's, it's kind of hard, but so we have these six quantities. Uh, now, one, two of these are the same. So in total, we have only five, but these five are different. They are not the same 
things. Yet, when we do stratigraphy, mostly because that's what that's the information we have available, we are only looking at uh, and this one and in, in maybe in, in theory or in experimental work, people bring up stratigraphic completeness. But what we really only have is, is thickness. But that doesn't mean that these other quantities are not there. So to explore this a little bit more, I want to use this data set from uh, the Jurassic Tank in St. Anthony Falls Laboratory. Uh, and I want to emphasize how, you know, the, only, only by really exploring this data set made me realize how, how amazing a data set this is and how much work went to it. Uh, it's more than 300 hours of experimental time. And you can download this from the web and play with it yourself. Uh, and what you see here is a visualization of uh, this, what happens in the subsiding basin while the sea level curve does this. So there is a long term sea level fall and rise and then, and then a faster one. And then shorter cycles superimposed a little bit like barrel did uh, on, a, on, a, on a larger cycle, right? Uh, so this, this, in this case, we have all the information uh, that we were uh, looking at in, in Beryl's synthetic plot, and this is data. Uh, so we can, uh, we can use this to explore these concepts a little bit more. And of course, we can also, in, in, in space, we can create a, a classic slot diagram from this, and that's what I did. Uh, so it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, red, of course, is erosional surfaces and I color the deposits by water depth so that it's more similar to an actual continental margin as opposed to a flume tank. Um, the beauty of this again is that this is data. This is not, not a model, of course, not a numerical model. This is data, yet it pretty much looks like a numerical model. Uh, okay, so let's look at a barrel plot that comes from pretty close to the input, which is on this side, of course. So we are looking at the delta and the water, the edge of the coast, the edge of the sea is somewhere over here. Doesn't really matter for our case. So let's look at a barrel plot from uh, this location, which is very proximal. And it looks like this. So stratigraphic completeness is 14%, uh, very limited. Uh, and because you have these big uh, cuts, big erosional events uh, later on. Uh, now, of course, uh, this uh, uh, there was a comment on, I, I posted that barrel animation on LinkedIn and somebody commented, well, uh, you know, looking at this, good luck to the paleoclimatologists reconstructing what happened in the past. Um, but of course, it's, it's uh, not that simple because uh, unless, you, unless you don't believe in mass conservation, what is eroded here is deposited somewhere else. And in this case, we know exactly uh, where it's going to be in the deeper part of the basin in the flume. So we can we can have more stratigraphically complete uh, uh, sections as well to state the obvious. Uh, and let me show that by moving further into the basin. So there is another uh, uh, well that we can uh, drill in, in this basin. Uh, and it, this looks a little bit better, uh, almost half of the of the time is represented in the record now, uh, but you still have significant erosion here and there and, and vacuity go that goes with it. And then finally, if we move further way into the basin, uh, then things look uh, a, a lot better. It's still highly variable sedimentation rate, right? You have these long periods of just a little bit of sediment getting there. This would be like a hemipelagic trape if you want in real life situations. And, and when there is erosion is, is barely there, right? So uh, this, this looks a lot more, a lot easier to deal with uh, for stratigraphers. Now, if, if we, if I, I come back for, to here for a second, uh, if we consider this bar here, the, the time axis and the way I colored it, uh, that's essentially a, a one-dimensional chronostratigraphic diagram, right? So if we do this not only at a single point in the basin, but we, we do it at every single point, then essentially we end up with a Wheeler diagram. And this is the first Wheeler diagram ever made. Uh, uh, again, um, I, I want to uh, call your attention to, to uh, this uh, part, which is called the, uh, Wheeler called it the degradation of vacuity, which is sediment, uh, I mean, it is time, this is measured in time, 
it is time that has been recorded in the stratigraphy but eroded later on. And this is the time when the erosion happened. So every erosional event has to be underlain by a degradation vacuity. And so we can play these games with the Jurassic tank data. And here is a cross section through the middle of the basin. This is a dip section going from proximal to distal, from left to right. Uh, red is erosion. These are units in, millimet in millimeters. Uh, blue is deposition. Uh, and the sea level curve is plotted as a black line over here. And one of the things that surprised me about this data set, maybe it's not that surprising for people who work with the Jurassic tank, is that there is, you know, it is, I, I'm always skeptical about simple sequence stratigraphic predictions, uh, but uh, it, it works overall uh, pretty well. Uh, basically, you have erosion mostly, certainly along the axis of the basin, is mostly concentrated during times of sea level fall like here and there and there and there and so on. And then you have these depot centers that are associated with, clearly they are coming from these erosional events uh, that develop up dip. Now, again, if we want to make a proper Wheeler diagram or chronostratigraphic diagram, uh, we want to consider uh, the deposits that were eroded later. So here I'm plotting everything uh, that has been deposited. So at this point, for example, uh, there was quite a bit of deposition because the, the, the intensity of the color uh, shows how much deposition there was. Uh, however, if you take into account, what, into account what has been eroded later, then you have to do this. So I, I just wiped out everything that uh, was eroded later and you can see how there is almost nothing preserved, certainly not in the early uh, stages in the proximal part of the basin. And things are look a lot better, of course, in, in the distal part of the basin. And of course, this is a 3D volume. We can slice through it like I'm trying to do in this plot. And these are the, the animations where you can start seeing how in some places the, the simple slug diagrams might start falling apart because the, the erosional surfaces are not just, uh, you know, they are time transgressive. Uh, and this is where ideas like the valley that, ne that never was uh, come in uh, uh, and, and so on. Very interesting uh, uh, ideas and, and a lot to explore. Uh, and you can do this exploration by uh, taking this volume into Python and, uh, and just, well, in, you could do this in other places as well, of course, but it's easy in Python. Uh, you can slice through it as a, through a seismic volume. So I'm, I, I took the screen recording in real time uh, and you can see the, the plan new section of the Wheeler diagram. Uh, and you can see the uh, strike and dip sections as well. And this, this moves really fast in, I'm using this, uh, package called uh, Mayavi. Uh, and you will see soon how it uh, looks like in the strike section again. And what I'm waiting for is actually the, the deep section. Uh, sorry, this was the deep section. And now we are going to look at the strike section uh, because that's where you can see, uh, let me stop it here. You can see these time transgressive erosional surfaces. Look how it's climbing up. It's not, if it was erosion was happening in a single time, uh, it, it would just be a horizontal line, but it's this erosional surface is climbing up that way and then coming up this way and so on. It kind of in a zigzag fashion as the, as the river is, is wiping across like a, a hose, uh, uh, the basin over here. But uh, let us come back to the idea of what type of uh, quantities we can actually look at. So the, the simple one is, is a thickness map, right? And this is a thickness map of the, uh, of the whole basin. Uh, uh, very simple, right? There is the big wedge, the depot center, uh, and it's much thinner on both sides of it. And this is what usually we can do and with, with normal like seismic data uh, and so on. But in a place like a Jurassic tank experiment or numerical models, we can create uh, five, other, five other maps. 
uh, and so in in thickness in 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 space uh, vacuity and erosion are the same they are just the flipped uh, version of each other right what you uh, the thickness yeah they are just the same let's not explain that further but in time we have three different maps and they are they are different from the thickness maps of course uh, so this is stratigraphic completeness uh, uh, and then we have vacuity uh, and erosion and these are not vacuity does not equal uh, obviously uh, deposition uh, uh, over here although the, the patterns are are similar and you can see how it, it's a, a you know if you think about uh, how how great it would be to be able to make these maps in real data sets uh, because then uh, you would have an idea where to look for um, you know, more complete uh, data sets, or you would have an idea of how incomplete your data set is, of course. And we can see that it's close to zero up here, uh, and then uh, it, it increases as we go into the basin. Um, so, one, I, I, I have been thinking about chrono stratigraphic diagrams for, for a long time, and, and early on, for, for a long time, I thought that, well, these are. You know this is super interesting, uh, and and it's amazing that that people came up with these ideas so so long ago. Um, but I always thought that well, they are just kind of of academic interest. But that I, I recently my mind has completely changed a few years ago on this, and I think they are really important tools in if in applied stratigraphy, and. I'm not the first one to realize this. Uh, uh, there are at least two companies that I know of uh, who work with uh, uh, seismic data, 3D uh, seismic data, to uh, and transform the seismic data into a, a chrono stratigraphic diagram. This is one example that comes from DGB Earth Sciences. I haven't tried this tool myself, but uh, it looks very good. And then there's another one uh, called PaleoScan, which uh, many of you might be familiar with, which is an excellent tool to pick horizons quickly. Uh, again, the, the idea behind PaleoScan is to create a stratigraphic diagram. Uh, so uh, this has been uh, tried and it is being used uh, already in the seismic world. Uh, it is less uh, commonly used or almost not at all in the world of well correlation. So for the rest of the talk, I mostly will talk about lock correlation. Uh, and before I, I get in, back into the chronostratic di chronos chronostratigraphic diagrams, I, I want you to think about this set of logs, okay? Uh, these are logs from the Permian Basin. And what I did here is um, record, screen recorded a quick, a few minute exercise of me correlating manually. Uh, and that's probably a low standard, but uh, Let's see if I can play the movie. So in the lower part, uh, it's it's pretty layer cake if you look closely. So it's you can quickly draw in some lines like I'm doing right now. Uh, all the logs are fairly similar. I'm pretty confident like that. And you could keep doing that. But in the upper part, uh, it becomes a lot more tricky. And I stop in places because I don't know exactly what to do. Uh, and this is sped up, by the way, like four times. Uh, I have to draw some dashed lines, uh, and then uh, I have to draw some question marks because uh, there's enough variability over here that I really don't know what, what to do with sections like this and that. Um, and and I, I, I have to say, I hate doing this because it's it's you constantly have to take these micro decisions, and it, it's just lots of uncertainty and and I don't I can't take it for very long uh, so a solution to this is to go back to Wheeler diagrams and and create one for uh, for this and that's what we are doing in this uh, uh, Python package which is called uh, we called it uh, maybe somewhat unimaginatively chronolog uh, and I'm gonna show you how this works but before I do that uh, I, I want to do another thought experiment. So this is an outcrop. Uh, and often when we look at outcrops and I do this myself is 
we are fascinated by these quick lateral changes. Uh, you know, I, I don't have a scale here, but this is basically a few hundred meters wide. And you see, for example, how this, this interbed here, you have a, a sandstone unit here uh, with some, with some mudstone partings maybe. And then laterally, if you follow it, it just goes away. And here it's completely amalgamated sandstone. And higher up, you see something similar, phases change from sandier to less sandy unit over here. So internally, these sandy units show quite a bit of variability if you look closely. And that's what we are fascinated by when we look at outcrops. But that outcrop was a small segment of this big image. This is, of course, from Grand Canyon National Park. And in a big picture, those little things that I pointed out, they don't matter. In the big picture, all these horizons can be correlated uh, like forever in the whole Grand Canyon. And that's a big thing. Uh, so in, in many cases, what we are trying to do in Vela correlation is to find these horizons. It's not to find those little interesting erosional features. Uh, and also because it would be impossible to find those in most, unless you have well logs like space like every 10 meters, which we never do. But we do have a lot of well logs. Here is a, a, a map of producing wells in the Permian Basin. Uh, it's just uh, I don't know what's the right word, but trying to correlate this manually is, is mind boggling. Uh, many companies have uh, uh, well databases that exceed 100,000 wells. Uh, so you can, imagine, you can imagine the amount of work this involves. Just forget about correlation, even keeping track of what is what and, and QCing those wells. So what we, we do in Chronolog uh, is basically can be broken down into four different things. One is dynamic time warping, uh, which is one of the algorithms for measuring similarity between two te temporal sequences. So for every sample in, in the log on the left, um, I have a correlative sample on the, in the log on the right, uh, and those lines show the correlations. And, and this is great. Uh, it, it's a lot of data. Quickly, you can get a, a lot of correlation lines, of course. But as a stratigrapher, as a geologist, this is not what I want. I want significant stratigraphic surfaces to be correlated, maybe the top of that sand and the base of that sand, or, or those mud units, if you want to correlate muds, right? Uh, so the way we deal with that, we don't want to dis make those, again, those micro decisions uh, manually. So we want a blocking uh, uh, tool that does this blocking automatically and does it at different scales. And people have done this before. We can use the continuous wavelet transform to convolve uh, this log with a wavelet of different frequencies and basically get a map like this. So imagine taking a, a, a wavelet, which is very high frequency, then you end up and convolve it with this, you, you end up with a log that is quite similar to this because it's very high resolution. And you start stacking it on the left side and then you increase, uh, decrease the frequency, sorry, you, you, uh, uh, you blur the, the log by uh, convolving it with uh, lower resolution wavelets and you end up with, with uh, 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 logs that are stacked on the right side. And what you see here is the zero lines, the zero contours on this wrinkled surface and the wrinkling is becoming stronger as you go to the left. Now I can take uh, at any given scale, I can take a section here and mark all the points where the zero crossings, the zero contour lines are crossed by the red line. And then I trace it back. This is very important. You trace it back all the way to the zero line. And that's where my boundary is. So if I do that, I have my, for that given scale, this is my stratigraphic split. The beauty of this approach, and you can see here, the, the, the whole idea is animated, the, the convolution on the right side. And as I'm sliding through this wrinkled surface, you see how the, the stratigraphic splitting is becoming finer and finer. And the beauty of this approach, aside from being fast, is that large scale boundaries are subsets of finer scale boundaries. So it's exactly what you expect from a stratigraphic hierarchy. Uh, there is no, the boundaries, the, the, the important boundaries stay put. And you can see that in this animation. Okay, 
Third component is building correlation panels. Somewhat simple, but important because we want to create intuitive displays. Uh, so here are two logs. Uh, I subdivided them into units by using the blocking as described before. Uh, I can color these in according to the log values. And here obviously uh, yellow stands for low gamma ray and brown for high gamma ray uh, average values for those intervals. And then using the dynamic time warping, I can match up all these units which it, with each other and painting the colors, just interpolating between the two end member colors. And I have something that looks geologically intuitive, I think. And this is how I want to display uh, correlation panels. So uh, I can build using this technique, I can take a cross section like this and start correlating from the left to right and build a panel like this. And it's, it's like, you could kind of declare a victory. This looks pretty good. Um, and I, I used to do these correlations before and, and declare victory and not many people complained. Uh, Jake did sometimes, but uh, that was about it. Uh, but this is fundamentally wrong um, because for, well, first of all, I couldn't make a map. Um, this only works as cross sections. And then if you do a different cross section, slightly different cross section, it will look slightly different, not fundamentally different, but slightly different. So let me illustrate this problem, which I call the curse of 2D log correlation. Uh, so here is, now I, instead of showing a section, I, I'm showing a loop with nine wells, right? Starting here, coming like this, and then coming back to the same well. So if we play this game, we create a correlation panel for this. By the time I come back from the sale to the same well, I should have the same tops, the same stratigraphic subdivisions, but that is not the case. Using this approach, you start accumulating the errors as you progress from the left to right, and you see how these tops are drifting uh, and bunching up and departing from each other. By the time I'm back, I'm back to this well, so this log is the same as that log. Uh, they are slightly shifted, not a lot, but it's enough that you know this is basically useless. So there are errors on the scale of a few meters for almost every single uh, top here by the time I close the loop. And then if I choose a different loop, which I obviously there are many, then those correlations, at least these don't contradict each other. But if you choose a different loop, then your, your picks are starting to contradict each other like big time. So I thought a lot about this and I could not find a solution until I read more carefully this uh, paper, which is, um, um, so this is a master's thesis of, of, by Laura Lee Wheeler. Her, uh, her name now is Laura Lee Dixon. Uh, and it's a master's thesis that basically said, okay, we can correlate well logs by creating a chrono stratigraphic diagram for them. And shows, obviously it's not just that, the paper shows exactly how to do that, which is the more difficult part. Uh, it is, you know, the number of great ideas in this short paper is just stunning uh, to me. And, and what I did was to take the time and really digest it and write some Python code so that I can do this in Python. So what do they do is take these logs uh, and stretch and squeeze them so that instead of depth, uh, we have time on the y-axis. Sounds familiar, uh, like this. So go from this to that. Uh, and this stretching and squeezing, figuring out how to do that, that's the, that's the crux of the problem. And that's what they figured out. So how does this work very briefly? Uh, if I have two logs and I want to, uh, I, I, uh, want to correlate, I want to match two depth values because that's the correlation. What I really need to find is the, the equivalent uh, value in relative geologic time. So I need to find an RGT of Z1 and RGT of Z2. And the way I do that is by calculating these shifts. These are depth values that for every sample in this log, I, I need a shift value, how much I need to stretch it or squeeze it. The same for this log. So I have for these two depth values, I have S1 and S2. And then uh, RGT Z1 equals Z1 plus S1, and the same for the, the other sample. If the two correlate, then these two quantities are the same. Uh, and then we can reorder them so that we have the unknowns are the shifts, 
that's what we are looking for. We know the Z2 and Z1 pair, we know this difference because that comes from the dynamic time warping, right? We have many, many uh, possible uh, uh, delta Zs from all these correlations that we get from the dynamic time warping. What we don't know are the shifts and those are the quantities that are needed for uh, the stretching and squeezing. So the way you basically end up with, because, because you have many, many uh, uh, pairs of, delta, of, of Z values, you end up with, uh, for any reasonable data set, you end up with millions of equations like this. So this is a big linear system of equations. We can attack it uh, using, uh, uh, basically it's a least squares optimization problem, which can be solved, again, this is all based on Wheeler and Hale, it can be solved using the conjugate gradient method, which means we are solving it with essentially a form of gradient descent, which means that we can check the box that we are doing machine learning, which is a good thing nowadays. And I'm not going to get into more details because it, 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 there is a lot more details, of course, of how exactly uh, this is done, but this is the, the core idea here. So let's see how it actually works. Uh, I'm going to show you a data set from uh, the eastern side of the Midland Basin, which is the eastern side of the Permian Basin. Uh, and um, uh, I'm not going to get into the details of the stratigraphy here. We are looking at uh, uh, lower Permian uh, deposits, uh, mostly uh, what is uh, of, of great interest uh, to us is, uh, uh, apologies to carbonate people, is the mostly siliciclastic sprayberry formation. Uh, so let's look at the, the base map. Uh, the red dots, of, of course, are all the vertical well locations that we have here. And the first thing we need to do is to decide which well pairs we want to correlate. Um, and you could say, like Wheeler and Hale, Hale basically said, well, we just correlate all the possible well pairs. But as your data set increases, uh, that becomes a problem. So here, what I'm showing is a maximum distance between wells of two kilometers and everything beyond that, I don't try to correlate because I say, well, beyond that point, it's probably there's not a whole lot of information in, in making the correlation. Uh, even with two kilometers as maximum distance, we have uh, more than 15,000 well pairs uh, for only 677 wells. And this is exponential. It, it blows up as you go to thousands of wells, uh, you, the number of well pairs just, just really goes up. Uh, and so we have, have uh, all these well pairs to deal with and keep track of. And the way we do this is by using a, a graph approach, a network approach, and using the obvious choice for that is network X, which is, again, another example of a great uh, open and free resource in, in Python. Uh, so we do all these correlations using dynamic time warping, all the 15,591. And then we do the stretching and squeezing, the optimization, uh, and uh, we end up with a chronostratigraphic diagram, uh, which looks like this. So we have uh, uh, the well numbers on the uh, x-axis here, relative geologic time. So these number are, numbers are basically meaningless. Uh, all I, it's, it's just... Uh, uh, all, all it's saying is that any point that is deeper than the other, than the point above is, is older, right? But the point is that any horizontal line here is a line of correlation because this is a chronostratigraphic diagram, right? So, and you see, it is, ideally, this should be a very layer cake looking thing. Uh, if you see layers dipping, uh, that's, uh, unless it's a very weird phases change, it's not a good thing. So for example, let me point out a, a problem here. This mud layer here shouldn't be dipping like it is. Uh, so is, it, is this perfect? Uh, no, it's not. But overall, you get a nice picture of the shelf carbonates, very finely layered in places, uh, very correlatable. Here's the sprayberry formation, which are uh, turbidites mostly, and then the wolf camp, which is uh, uh, more uh, carbonate rich, uh, deeper in the section. Uh, and every single pixel here, pixel wide column here is a well log. Uh, and the color is by uh, normalized gamma ray values or, or a V shale, right? And it, it quickly, this, this is very valuable because it gives you an overview of the whole stratigraphy of the whole area right away. And you can make a, a, a 
type log by simply taking the average along the horizontal axis of all these logs, right? Uh, and that's what the black curve is. Uh, so this is great, uh, but uh, uh, what I also want is conventional cross-sectional displays as we, as, we, uh, as we usually do as geologists. So let's look at a strike section that runs like this. Uh, and that's how it looks like with the lithology painted in. And again, this is the sprayberry part. And you see these, these big lenses of, of what is probably sandstone over here and there. So these are probably, not probably, they are uh, sand filled turbidite channels uh, running down the slope. Uh, what I wanna do next is to take a cross section that runs along the axis of this big channel over here. Uh, and that's the map view of that. And here uh, is the, uh, here are the correlation lines and we can paint in uh, the stratigraphy. Uh, and the reason why this sand is so continuous in this section is that because it's because we are running along exactly along the axis of the channel, right? Uh, and then the interesting thing is like, probably not a lot of people would question that correlation, but if we come down here, things are a lot uh, uh, more difficult. And this is, uh, I think this is where I got that example from earlier on, where you would have to make these decisions like, what do you do with this? How do you correlate this sandy unit with something that is not that sandy over there? Uh, and so on, lots of, lots of change in this section over here, yet Chromolog just zips through it in a fairly layer kick fashion, but I think that's fine. This is a little, little bit like PaleoScan, if you are familiar with PaleoScan. Uh, uh, that it, it kind of forces a layer cake framework. Uh, and again, I think that's the right thing to do because if, you know, I could go on and on about how probably this is a channel field or whatever, or that is a channel field and draw some nice smileys here. But do I know that for sure? No. And unless I start drilling like 10 more wells in between, I will never know for sure. So uh, it, it, the best option is to to recognize that and have a, a larger scale stratigraphic frame framework. And this approach also gives us the opportunity to make maps uh, that are more meaningful, uh, as you will see uh, just in a second. In fact, uh, exactly less than a second. So what I'm showing here is one of the logs, actually not one of the logs, this is the type log, the mean V-shale log. Uh, subdivided, split into many, many small units. Again, we can change this, this, the scale of this sub, subdivision if we want to. And I'm highlighting the red box, the stratigraphic unit that you see the map of on the right. Uh, and I'm starting up at the top, uh, weirdly enough, and moving down and just scrolling through this, uh, uh, going through this section over here. Uh, and uh, over here, you can already see a, a like a linear feature, which is pointing in the downslope direction, uh, but it's not too impressive. Uh, but I kind of like these maps, the way uh, to, to generate these maps that shows, you know, I'm not extrapolating much further than the, where the, the, the logs are. And people have been asking me, how, uh, how do I do this? Uh, and the answer is uh, I'm using this fantastic, uh, again, open source and free package that uh, uh, is familiar to some of you to say the least. So this is Leonardo Ueda's uh, Verdi. Uh, and uh, it, again, it's a great tool for gridding irregularly spaced data like uh, the one, uh, the type of data we are dealing with here. So let me move on to uh, deeper parts. Again, you see other, maybe other channels, other linear features coming down uh, and then here we come into the, that big channel that we have been looking at, right? So let me, oops. Why is this jumping around? Um, so here is the big channel. This, I, I like showing this because this is the most beautiful channel that I mapped uh, probably not just uh, aut automatically, but manually as well, in, certainly in rail logs. Uh, and uh, you see uh, uh, signs of other channels like that. Uh, and so on. And, and of course you can, you can uh, if you go back, you can quickly slice through the whole data set and have these maps of your depositional elements. Uh, once you created this stratigraphic framework, 
uh, you can you can quickly do that. Now, um, the obvious question is, what about more difficult stratigraphic things like unconformities and and rapidly changing thicknesses like and pinch outs and so on? So, for example, are we able to map clinoforms and it, this is this is tough. Of course, the stratigraphy I showed before was pretty layer cake, so it's not. Uh, that is, I, I don't think it's an easy problem there either. But uh, it's much easier than in places where you have lots of change uh, in the stratigraphy. And if we zoom out, so I have been showing you this data set over here, this patch. If we zoom out, there is a lot more stratigraphy, and it gets more complicated because you are going from the shelf into the basin, and there are clinoforms. So the question is, can we get this approach to, to map the clinoforms? And I'm showing this red line, the, the cross section uh, down here, going from uh, the shelf into the basin. Uh, and I'm going to show you what the software did using a much larger data set than what I'm showing here, kind of a basin-wide data set. And you see the correlation lines, and you see the clinoforms. Uh, and this is not perfect. Uh, I'm pretty sure there are some big jumps here and there like those. So those are too steep uh, for the clinoforms that are here. Uh, some of these very uh, uh, gradually uh, descending lines are probably not steep enough. Uh, but I think it gets the big picture right. And it, you know, this, this code doesn't know anything about clinoforms and syst systems tracts and you name it. It, it, it only knows that I need to create a framework uh, that satisfies everything in 3D uh, and uh, horizons don't cross, right? So that's, in all these approaches, this is very important. I'm not trying to map a single horizon at a time in, in isolation. I'm you taking advantage of the fact that uh, uh, stratigraphic surfaces don't, uh, don't cross each other. Uh, it's a basic thing, but it, it's very, very helpful. Uh, so the short answer is that if you have good data, I think it can, but this is, I'm really pushing the limits here. And I, I you know, there's a lot more work to do uh, in, in many respects with this package. Uh, but I think uh, the, the concept itself is, is very promising. So to come back to barrels plot and, and the Wheeler diagrams, if I have a section like this, uh, can I actually, oops, can I actually reconstruct this? Well, of course not. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm not a magician and chronolog isn't either. Uh, so what we can hope for, of course, to reconstruct is that line. Uh, essentially recognize that there are gonna be intervals like this where the rate of sedimentation is way lower uh, than over here. And of course, it, it's, it's, we already kind of do that because if we have a con recognize a condensed section in a core or in an outcrop, we know that this is what we are dealing with. The question is more, can we do this uh, quasi automatically uh, using well logs uh, and, and seismic? Uh, and I think, uh, I think people have been already showing this with seismic uh, successfully. Uh, and I think uh, the, the age of doing this in well logs, uh, well log data set is, it's, data sets is coming as well. Uh, and I think that's uh, my last slide. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, the sponsors of our research group, which, research group, which is called the Quantitative Classics Laboratory. Uh, I wouldn't be able to play with these data sets and tools uh, without the support of these companies and uh, institutions. Uh, and I also want to highlight uh, the uh, all these uh, fantastic resources in terms of uh, freely available open source uh, software. Uh, thank you. Fabulous, Sultan. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, I think we've got some time for questions. So uh, I think the format is you can either flip your camera and microphone on and ask Sultan directly, or if you're um, if you don't want to do that, you can type a question into the chat window. So whilst we wait for some questions to come in, I have a, a, a question to get us started, Sultan. You, you, I mean, there's lots and lots of interesting things in here that we could talk about. I think, but you, you made. 
uh, a comment about that um, Jurassic tank experiment right at the beginning, saying that it was very much like the standard slug diagram. But but do you think that's perhaps because they set it up to be like that? I mean, from what you know of those experiments, do you think those experiments could produce substantially different types of geometry to the, the clinoform sets that are in that experiment? Yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, the, the setup in on this experiment uh, is, is fairly simple, right? You just have a simple subsidence uh, profile and you have some, you have some sea level drops and rises uh, and that's it. Um, and I was, you know, I, I spent a lot of time slicing through it and animating everything. And, and initially I was looking for, you know, the, the constant skeptic would, always look for bugs in the system and 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 you can find those and and it's not it's much more complicated than a, you know a sequence stratigraphy 101 kind of approach for sure but i was actually surprised how well the you know i showed that cross section and and it it i was surprised how well statistically speaking it, it actually matches the the this simple idea that when you when the sea level is falling then the shelf is being incised and you are depositing a lot of sediment into the deep water and all that seems to be seems mm. to be fine um so I, I i i don't know how how far you could push it by having different setups um and i i think i think it the problem is that that in in many many cases uh, we obviously don't have this much information, so we are fooling our, ourselves if we think that we can reconstruct that much detail. But, but yeah, maybe that was a too long with an answer. But. Oh no, no, that's fine. I mean, I think some other people have experimented with a different purpose in mind to to understand how that simple model, you know breaks under certain conditions so i think you know uh, mutto and steel showed if you are pumping much more sediment through the transport system then the response to the base level fall is quite different right i mean there, there are there are things like that but um you know i'm always just curious about how much it can vary under different conditions but um i i shouldn't be asking all the questions has anybody else got a question i Leo, I, go on yeah, thanks for a great talk. Um, so this this is definitely not my field at all. So I, it, it might be a very naive question. Uh, that that was not my question. <laughs> uh, so I'm wondering. So you showed these examples where you have thousands of wells, uh, but I imagine that's not the case in in many places. So I'm just wondering if there, if you know, like, is uh, how sensitive is this method to uh just the number of data points that you have right yeah that's that's obviously a good question um and and it's essentially it's, it's it's more about well spacing relative to the variability of the stratigraphy uh, if you don't have um uh if you the wells are too far apart then of course uh you have a problem and i i basically like to say that uh uh, show me the logs. If I look at a cross section, uh, just just the logs themselves, and if I immediately see that, yeah, I can kind of see how I would start correlating this. Then, then I say, okay, we can give it a try. If I don't see that, if I'm looking at it like, yeah, I really have no idea how to start correlating here, then all hope is lost for this kind of approach. I think. So you you need to see the similarities in the, in neighboring logs. That's the bottom line. And then it, it might work. So is there like a, a, a rule of thumb at least or, or some sort of experiment for how far apart the logs can be and you can still find a meaningful correlation? Um, I, no, I, I, I've been thinking about running an experiment 
uh, is just like you said, to take a data set where we know the answer, maybe like the Jurassic tank or something like that, and uh, um, run this experiment, like how far I can push the wells from each other before everything crumbles. But I, I haven't done that yet. Yeah, great, great question. Uh, any other questions from anybody? I can't see anything typed. Um, we have a question on the YouTube stream, which is uh, from Mariana asking, um, in your last slide, you showed the software used. Could you give more details about the specific tasks that each one covered? Uh, you mean uh, this slide? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I guess, I mean, Python is just the programming language, right? In the whole, whole environment where... Uh, many of us do pretty much everything nowadays and uh, but what is more important here i guess like all, all of the plots uh, or most of the plots uh, i make in matplotlib and then my is just a 3d uh, visualization uh, package and i mentioned network x uh, which is uh, for dealing with graphs so the in order to keep track of the logs uh, it's basically uh, it's very difficult to, to create a database for log correlation, which um, does not involve a graph structure in some way, I think. So that's what I use NetworkX for. And then I talked about Verdi for making the maps. Uh, and the, the package itself, it, which I, I, we have built in, in our research group that is called Chronolog. And that is not, uh, oops, uh, that is not available to the public yet, it's basically um, it's uh, something that we share with our sponsors. Cool. So I have one, one final question then for you, uh, Zoltan, and we should probably uh, stop. Do you think, I mean, following on a little bit from Leo's question, do you think if you can't correlate that though is actually giving you some information about the nature of the strata. I mean, it's not necessarily just a bad result. Is it? It's telling you something about. I mean, maybe how ordered versus disordered yeah. the strata are in some sense. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think that's that's right. So that if I maybe, I can go back uh, quickly here. This one, so. Let's say I only had uh, logs from this interval. If you see my cursor from, from about here to, to down here. Um, and without these, these nice mud stones that run through above and below. Um, so if I only had this interval, uh, it probably this code would have a hard time doing the correlation or doing a good correlation anyway. Um, because there's so much variability. Mm -hmm. uh, and even here, I can see that, you know, and I, we haven't come up with a way to quantify what you see here in terms of like this unit down here is clearly much better behaved than, than this one. So how do you actually describe that in, a, mm -hmm. in some quantitative way, like some kind of similarity measure? You know, the, the dynamic time warping is, is actually a similarity measure in many ways. So. Mm -hmm. There are lots of things to explore in this direction, but uh, mm -hmm. didn't do it yet. Yeah, no, that would be really interesting. I mean, I think particularly the fact that you can do the similarity on different scales, because I mean, that you know, from that from the order analysis I do, that's that's the thing that's critical because you get different levels of order very much at the different scales you look, and being able to quantify that would be fabulous, actually. So I, th I think that will be a, definitely a fruitful thing to pursue. Right. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Caitlin, do I, do, I, do, we, do I hand this back to you now? Uh, yeah. Um, we have a couple more questions on YouTube, but uh, maybe Zoltan, you could answer them in text uh, later on, if that's okay. okay. Uh, yeah, so that's we'll finish up now. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, we're now going to head over to the Gather Town, to, for continued discussion. So everybody here is welcome.